this evening. I was asked to give a talk on a, a subject uh, uh, which is to do with the seven factors of enlightenment or the seven factors of awakening the mind to truth, the seven factors of liberation. And how we use uh, each one of these factors for cultivating the mind and developing, in particular, meditation. Mm. Um, for anyone who has developed a level of circumspection, uh, has a, and a sensitivity and awareness to their own mental and moods and emotions and psychology, or who is uh, a meditator, who is open uh, to the ups and downs of their thoughts and moods and ideas, you'll be aware that there are certain times uh, when the mind is calm and serene. There are other times when it's agitated and restless. And uh, how we deal with those states of mind in the meditation is not the same. We don't always meditate in the same way on the same subject under all conditions at all times. Uh, it's like if you are going to uh, hire a carpenter to come and do some work on your house and the fellow rolled up with just a hammer hand and that was the limit of his tools would you have great confidence to give that person uh, the job of repairing your furniture building your house if that's the limit of his toolkit as someone else rolls up uh, uh, with a lot of experience and uh, a vast array of tools in their toolkit it gives great confidence that they will be able to deal with any of the problems and difficulties that come up in the building process. So too in meditation, mm. we begin with one or two techniques or one or two skills, one or two methods of calming the mind, one or two methods of training the mind, but that shouldn't be the limit of our toolkit because uh, the subject or object of meditation is a skillful means. It's a tool. It's a tool that we use for training the mind. Watching the breath is nothing esoteric or marvelous in itself. It's how we use it. It's a tool. It's a method. Uh, and in Buddhism, we're using a variety of tools and we use them for two purposes for two goals the first of those goals is to calm and still and make serene content and tranquil and peaceful a restless agitated disturbed wild mind and the other purpose uh, and tool that we use in our meditation, another goal of our meditation, is to develop clarity, vision, knowledge, insight into what's going on in our minds and bodies so that that clarity leads to a knowledge and understanding, what we call wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to know clearly as it truly is what's going on in the body and mind and its qualities, its characteristics, its aspects. And when they're known clearly as they really are, then it leads to letting go, to freedom, to liberation, to awakening, to this quality that we hear so often, the word enlightenment. Uh, so if we understand 
that meditation has these two purposes. The first, to calm the mind. The second, to develop knowledge and wisdom. And, and mm. to calm the mind, we use various techniques for calming the mind when it's agitated and for developing insight and knowledge we use other techniques which may not be used at the time we want to calm the mind. Uh, for example, uh, if you're sitting meditation uh, as we did in the last half hour and you nod off, uh, we have heard often snoring in the Buddhist society here, um, <laughs> and uh, don't worry, uh, that that just shows that uh, you're too relaxed. The mind has gone to tranquility, but there's no awareness. There's no clarity. There's no knowledge. There's no understanding there. Uh, it's the mind is so calm that it falls off into dullness and sloth and torpor. And that is understandable because most of you have led very busy, very stressful, very worrying, very uh, agitated lives. And that lifestyle, when you come along to the Buddha center, have to rush from work, and have something to eat, rush in here, and then you sit down, and when you stop, suddenly you switch off. That's okay. Uh, but there is a way of improving that and changing that by developing clarity, by developing sharpness. And so when we sit and we find that we say go to dullness and uh, tiredness of body, and then there's certain qualities of mind and body that we need to develop. We need to develop qualities, for example, like obviously energy and perseverance, joy, and also the qualities of contemplation, of analyzing reality, looking at its qualities. And we need the development of very sharp, clear awareness. They're the spiritual qualities we need to brighten up a dull mind to give precision to it. Uh, and the opposite is true. If the mind, when we come in and sit meditation, you know, through that activity, that busyness of the day, we carry that on, that momentum of what we've just talked about, what we've just done, uh, what we need to do, uh, when we need to do it, all the activities and things that have gone on in our lives and all the ups and downs, the dramas and activities and things that have happened in our lives in the last period. We come to sit and that just runs on in the mind like this endless train of thought. We find it very difficult to calm that mind and there's agitation. And then when we try uh, to sit, we find the mind is, is uh, so speedy and so active at that time, we need to develop spiritual qualities that are serene, that lead to tranquility, uh, spiritual qualities that are based in letting go, equanimity, to be balanced, uh, to not be excited. And uh, we need to develop also mindfulness, uh, clarity. And we need concentration, calm, a peaceful, calm, one-pointed state of mind. These are the types of qualities we need to calm that mind down, a quality of bringing that agitated mind to stillness. And so... Uh, it's around this subject that I want to talk this evening. Uh, and uh, I, 
This is a, comes from a discourse that the Buddha gave. He, talking about, he was talking about these seven, what we call seven factors of enlightenment. And I've just briefly mentioned them in that introduction, uh, but I'll maybe mention them in a bit more detail now. The first of those factors of enlightenment, if you want to get enlightened, the first thing you have to develop is mindfulness, sati. This is the quality of mind which recalls what you're doing. But mindfulness in Buddhism uh, is a particular type of mindfulness, a particular type of awareness. Mindfulness is the ability to remember, the ability to recall. Uh, So we can recall what we're doing, when we're doing it, and what we should be doing. But also, mindfulness goes together with this quality of sampajanya. It's the wise attention and circumspection uh, of the state of what we're recalling and what it's used for. For example, someone can be drinking a glass of beer and they're recalling, they know that they're drinking a glass of beer. That ability to remember recall is uh, that awareness. They're aware that they're drinking at that time. The sampajanya is the ability, the wisdom to know that is this useful for myself in my ultimate good? Does this lead to liberation? Am I free from the multinational companies? Am I free from my desires? Am I benefiting my body? And am I better benefiting my mind? Does this lead to clarity? Does this, this lead to wisdom? Does this lead to understanding? That is the quality of the sampajanya, the circumspection, which has a sense of awareness and consciousness to put things in context. Does this lead to nibbana? So the quality of mindfulness in uh, the quality of enlightenment uh, has also the qualities of sampajanya in it. It knows what leads to spiritual development. It knows what is beneficial. What it knows is it is aware of the body, it is aware of mind, uh, it is aware of feeling, and it's aware of dhammas. It's aware of these four things. Body, feeling, mind, and truth. These are the things that it recalls. And it is this ability to be aware, to be conscious, to recall, but also to recall in a context of the spiritual path. Does this lead to my benefit? Or is there consequences to my action? Uh, What's the negative consequences? What's the positive consequences? So we see the results. Uh, the other quality of, of mind that we bring to meditation uh, it's, uh, and is a quality of enlightenment is the ability to analyze, to intellectually perceive and know and understand. But it doesn't just mean to think intelligently about spiritual things uh, and rationalize, but it means to clearly comprehend and and consider to contemplate and reflect. Uh, And it means to reflect on truth, to reflect on birth, to give time to consider aging, give reflection on that illness is a natural quality. Health is a natural quality, but it declines and there must be ill health. And that sickness leads to the aging process and finally the passing away, just as any tree or any animal, any creature, any living thing arises and passes away. Having been born into the world, it uh, changes Nothing is stable. 
this ability to reflect on the changing nature of all your experience. This is what we call investigation of Dhamma, analysis of the truth, so that when an experience comes up in our lives, we consider, we reflect on it, we don't block it out, we don't uh, um, reject it, we don't uh, try to avoid it. So if we're suffering, we're unhappy, if there's pain or tension in the body or mind, then we contemplate that. We turn our attention at some stages in our spiritual development to give that serious consideration. And we don't give it just casual consideration. We reflect for a long time over that quality. Uh, For example, if you have pain arising in the legs when you're sitting, then instead of denial or avoidance or the wanting to escape by moving the posture, one can contemplate. Have I ever given a thought to try to analyze what pain is? And then have that courageousness of mind to turn the attention to look at that feeling. And neutrally just note in the mind, feeling, a painful feeling. Not my feeling, but just painful feeling. And then watch. What's its quality? This investigation of truth means the ability to analyze the characteristics of something, its quality, its nature, almost like its personality. What's the personality? What's the characteristic? What's the quality? What's this aspect of feeling? And then we note, is that feeling permanent and everlasting? Or does it arise and pass away? Is it pulsating? So we tune our mind in to contemplate and consider, to analyze feeling. And where does feeling arise? It arises from contact. Uh, and where does contact arise from? It arises through the sense doors. So we start to start to unwind this process. Where does this having sense doors arise from? It arises from having a body and mind, doesn't it? Where does a body and mind arrive from? It arises from having been born. Uh, and where does having been born come from? It arises from these conditioned phenomena, coming from formations which come from ignorance. With ignorance there is a rising of beings in the world. We start to see this process. We start to analyze. We start to consider, reflect, and take that uh, reflection back to where it's coming from. Where's the source? To analyze back. Uh, And this quality of analysis we need to use sometimes in a meditation, and I'll explain this a bit later on. Uh, this is called the contemplation or anal- analyzation, investigation of truth. Uh, so we use the power of the mind to know, to intellectualize, to contemplate and consider and develop that ability, but developing it in its analysis of truth. So don't be afraid to look at difficult taboo subjects like your own death what's it mean to die have you ever thought about it what happens what happens when the body breaks up what happens when the mind lets go what's death similar to and so we start then to notice that there's always these process of death, isn't it? The air that we've breathed out has passed away. It's gone. And it will be taken in by somebody else. 
I was uh, talking to one of the monks uh, just recently, and he was telling me that someone has actually done a calculation uh, of the volumes of air that a person breathes in in a lifetime and the amount of molecules and how those molecules dissipate. And they estimate that every time we breathe in, we're taking in at least 50 molecules of air or carbon dioxide that uh, Leonardo da Vinci breathed in. I'm taking that purely on hearsay. I don't know whether it's accurate or not, but that's what he said. Someone may, maybe could check that out for me. But it's interesting, isn't it, that what we've breathed, what he's breathed out, we're now breathing in. And what we're breathing out, people 400 years, 500 years down the track, will breathe in. Who does this breath belong to? It doesn't belong to anybody, does it? It's just there. Breathe in and goes out. And when this body goes to ash and to dust, who does it belong to? Does it belong to anybody? And this process is going on here and now. Who's the real controller? So this is what we turn our intellect to, to contemplate and consider these things, uh, these you know, questions of life, and give serious thought for a long period of time. And you can use that as a meditation subject. The other quality, which is very important for the development of uh, the spiritual qualities that lead to enlightenment, is, is energy. And uh, it's, it's called wiriya in Pali. And I think if we use the word energy, it sometimes gives, especially uh, people brought up uh, in the West, uh, the idea of just like physical and mental willpower or effort. But it really, I think a better translation is perseverance. Because sometimes we can have lots of intense energy, but we lack the perseverance. It's a bit like the old fable of the, the hare and the tortoise. We've got that intense effort and energy over a short period and a short burst. But actually we need that perseverance, that constant uh, applying the mind and uh, all of you who have done any form of meditation or any sp form of spiritual development you realize that perseverance is one of the fundamental underlying qualities of success isn't it uh, it's like learning it's even harder much harder than playing a musical instrument it has to persevere through the, the mundane difficult aspects of learning uh, the scales and you know, constantly practicing over and over and over again and sometimes it seems like you're not getting anywhere it seems difficult it seems frustrating but it's this quality to persevere uh, to constantly apply both physical effort uh, to get up in the morning or uh, go to the meditation cushion at night when you come home, home and you don't feel like doing it it's that perseverance when you've got all the excuses, all the good reasons why you shouldn't be meditating tonight, but you do, that is going to help you on the path to getting results. Uh, because we, we know that the mind is a great pr procrastinator, isn't it? It always says, I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, I'll do it later, next time, next week next lifetime. <laughs> I encourage some people to ordain as monks or nuns and they say, oh, well, next lifetime, Venerable Sir. <laughs> it's just putting off. Even if we know something is good for us, we try to postpone it. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, things uh, like change, sickness or death, it doesn't postpone. It doesn't get put off. It happens. And we don't know when. And it's this constant applying, uh, 
putting forth the effort, even when it's difficult, even when we don't want to do it. Ajahn Chah used to always say, um, if you feel like meditating, then meditate. If you don't feel like meditating, then meditate. And it's that constant perseverance, that constant trying. It's over the years, over the constant effort that we try to develop wholesome qualities that haven't yet arisen. And we sustain wholesome qualities that have already arisen in us. And we try to overcome the unskillful, the unwholesome, um, the unbeneficial qualities that arise within our mind. And we try to not allow them to arise again in the future. This is this quality of perseverance, which is a factor of awakening. If you're persevering with your spiritual practice, then you're on the path. You're developing this factor of enlightenment, the factor of freedom, the factor of liberation. Uh, The other quality, uh, which is a factor of of enlightenment, is serenity, pasadahi in Pali, which means both tranquility and serenity. And this is this quality to to be at ease in both body and mind. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a very beautiful uh, Thai word. I was trained in Thailand. And uh, there is a word that every person who goes to the country of Thailand will hear and pick up very quickly. And it's a very difficult word to translate, but it's sabai. And uh, uh, one day... Uh, uh, a monk was telling me he went, a Western monk who's visiting a monastery, uh, went to visit a, a Thai teacher. His name was Achan Ganha, and he's been to Perth here. And uh, they asked him to give some advice to the monks on meditation just at the beginning of the rains retreat. And uh, this uh, monk said his uh, discourse was when you sit, make your mind. Sabai. And when you walk, make your mind sabai. That was it. That was the end of his discourse. And this word sabai means to, and it's a very hard word to translate, but it's a combination of to be at ease and to be happy, to be serene and content means to be physically at ease but not lax but relaxed and just at ease so you can just put down the burden of the body you feel comfortable and there's a sense of physical happiness there physical well-being and there's a sense of mental well-being to be at ease just to be at ease mentally. That's it. It's all easy. To be at ease means to perceive that it's all easy. If we approach meditation and think it's so terribly hard, it's such a difficult thing, it's such a burden, uh, we can't do it, we're not uh, any good, we're hopeless, then we're not at ease. We're not just having this sense of taking it with an open mind, taking it with a sense of well-being and contentment and peace and happiness. We have a sense of ease in the mind. And that ease, when we have this sense of well-being in the mind, leads to tranquility. The mind calms down. And tranquility is not a blacking out or a blocking out or an emotional annihilation. It's actually there is this sense of inner joy and inner happiness, inner contentment, and just ease with the world the way it is, regardless of how it is. We know that some things are not good, not pleasant in the world. But to have this sense of serenity in the mind, it's like when we see uh, a Buddha image, you notice that the Buddha images of the Buddha after his enlightenment 
has a serene smile. That sense of serenity. That sense of stillness in the world. Tranquility. Sense of peace and calm. That is a factor of enlightenment. Um, and there is another of the seven factors of enlightenment is rapture. And rapture is a, a natural development of being at ease, being sabai, being tranquil. Is that there will be a sense of rapture. And, and rapture has uh, this uh, quality of uplifting uh, joy. And rapture has many aspects. There's a physical aspect of the happiness associated with rapture. For example, you know, when you feel that tingling sensation of all the hairs standing on end, uh, that's rapture. Or sometimes you're so happy that tears come to your eyes. That's a quality of rapture, a, fa a fairly coarse quality of rapture, but nevertheless, that is a quality of rapture. Uh, or sometimes you see, feel so buoyant that you shiver all over and there's waves of physical pleasure go through the body. This is what we call rapture. And if rapture gets even more refined, then there's this whole all-pervading sense of tingling sensation in the body. Uh, that also is a quality of rapture. And if it's refined ev even more, then the qualities is that the, the body starts to expand where the body gets so light and buoyant, you feel like you're going to float. Just through the sheer joy, sheer pleasure, there is a rising from a mind based in a wholesome object. Mm. For example, if you reflect on goodness, sometimes it can just bring sheer joy to the mind when we hear of some wonderful act of kindness uh, that someone does. And it just brings great pleasure to the mind to hear of some virtuous, considerate, compassionate act another being can do for others. Or when we, uh, we have this uh, um, mind which rejoices in just the goodness, virtue, uh, or when we develop thoughts of loving kindness, and it can bring great rapture, feelings of buoyancy, feelings of lightness, till almost the body disappears and just there's this feeling of all-pervading rapture. Those qualities is a quality, uh, that quality, sorry, is a quality which leads to enlightenment. Uh, and it's actually one quality that I've noticed is lacking in people's meditation. Often people come to meditation with a very intense and serious attitude. Yes, one needs to be serious about spiritual development, but there has to be joy as well. And that's why in Buddhism you find that one of the fundamental pathways that people, the Buddha taught to obtain joy is to be generous. That's why in Buddhism generosity is greatly emphasized. It's just like when you say, at Christmas time, you sit around and watch young children open the gifts that you've given them or on their birthday. It brings a lot of joy and it can bring a sense of delight and rapture. Rapture brings delight uh, that you've brought happiness to others. In Buddhism, we try to make every day Christmas. doing acts of kindness, generosity, every day. Find a way to give. 
doesn't have to be huge sums of money. It's the intention behind the gift. It's the sincerity. It's the purity of the gift and the purity of the giver, not its material value that's important. Uh, uh, when we had a visiting meditation teacher, Ajahn Bliang, the other day, uh, well, a few weeks ago, come at our monastery, he said to the people who came and offered the meal to the monks, he said, you know, this food that you've brought uh, will be consumed by all of us, all the people in this monastery, the monks and all of the laity who are going to share in this meal, will be consumed very quickly. So this material gift doesn't last very long. But the goodness, the quality of heart, the kindness and, in, and sincerity with which it was offered, that lasts for a long, long time. And it is that act of generosity which brings up what we call happiness and rapture. And that's the direct benefit of joy, of generosity. It leads to joy. The direct benefit of doing acts of kindness to others brings up joy. And so it's true that uh, the monks, often when they come to places like this or our Armadale Center, and just by giving a talk on Buddhism, an act of generosity that the monks offer to the lay community because we don't have anything material to give to you. I have very little. But I can offer this, uh, guidance and advice. And you find that many of the monks, they can't sleep at night when they go back because there's so much joy in the mind. Why is that? It's because of just the act of giving to so many people brings up this sense of bliss, sense of delight, that I'm happy if you're happy. I'm happy if I can help. I'm happy to give what I can give. And that act of generosity is extremely important and it directly brings joy, brings a smile to your life, to your face and to your meditation. Uh, and this leads to rapture, a spiritual quality of enlightenment. The other quality of enlightenment uh, is uh, the once we've developed this uh, rapture, it is the quality of calm and concentration. And you've probably heard many talks on what we call samadhi, this ability of the mind to be stable, serene and peaceful. We focus on one object for a long period of time uh, to notice the detail and absorb into that object, to become one with that object. And I have no doubts that many of you, if not all of you, have had moments in your life when you've been quiet, when you've been contented, when you've been maybe alone in a very comfortable place, maybe by the sea, near a waterfall, on a mountain, and you've just sensed a sense of oneness with your surroundings, a sense of well-being, a sense of nowhere to go, nothing to, you have to do, a sense of ease and contentment and peace. Uh, and there's a sense that you feel at peace with the world. Now that quality, when it's developed and intensified, when it goes more powerful, more focused on one thing, for example, the breath, the mind just focuses on that one object of breath, stays with that one object of breath, knows just the breath, and that mind will become one with the breath, become unified with the breath. And so much so that all uh, aversion, all sensuality, all doubt, all restlessness, 
or dullness will disappear. And there's just left this one pointedness mind, rapture and happiness, and the mind staying and unified with that object. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is this quality of this one pointedness of mind, samadhi. And that can be developed even more to the point where there's just equanimity there and one pointedness of mind as the culmination of samma samadhi, right concentration, perfection of concentration of the mind on one object. And that is the highest happiness. And then there is the, the uh, later quality or last quality of the enlightenment, which is equanimity. Equanimity is uh, uh, a quality which is sometimes misunderstood is the, uh, the aspect of mind which is balanced, which is no, neither going towards delight or dislike, which is neither agitated with excitement and pleasure or agitated with aversion and negativity. It is stable, it is centered, it is uh, poised and balanced. The mind which doesn't go to like and dislike. So develop this quality in the mind where, for example, uh, we can be balanced, poised, stable, and not react with aversion to, say, physical discomfort or even mental discomfort when we're abused or criticized, uh, when we're uh, found fault with. This ability to be poised, to be balanced, to not uh, be upset, to just take it as it comes. And this is very difficult, isn't it? But it is this quality of, the spiritual quality of equanimity to take the li uh, life's ups and downs as they come and they go. Uh, to know that all beings are born of their karma and are supported by their karma, born of their actions, supported by their actions, related to their actions, and receive the fruit of their actions. Uh, then the mind can be more at ease with the problems of life and stay centered and focused. Equanimity is letting go of things, not trying to change them, not trying to force them to be a certain way, not try to fit in with our opinions and views and our likes and dislikes, but just to be balanced and watch, to know. It's the aso. This is the way it is. Ah, this is the way it is. Ah, oh, so this is the way it is. Just to sit and watch. So someone says you're the greatest person in the world. Ah, oh, this is the way it is. Someone says you're the most miserable, mean-hearted, lousy person in the world. Ah, oh, so this is the way it is. That ability to just uh, focus the mind on just being balanced and stable. So, uh, if you can do that, then you you start to do that by knowing that uh, praise and blame are just the way of the world. Uh, it's very interesting. Sometimes, after giving a talk here, people will come up and say, "Achan, I didn't like the talk you gave." And someone else will come up and say, that was a wonderful talk. Oh, you knew my mind. That was perfect. How did you, how did you know that's exactly what I wanted you to talk to about? So you just have to say, oh, this is the way it is. Yes. You just accept as it comes. And that allows you not to get, you know, when someone praises, we get excited and delighted. 
When someone criticizes, we get depressed and sad. You start to stay in the middle. You just do your best. You do your duty. You try to deal with the problems in, in life as best you can with as much clarity and wisdom and clear and sincere intentions as possible. And the ups and downs, the praise and blames, the happiness, the sorrow, the gain and the loss, the fame and criticism. That's just the winds. That's just the noise of the world. Uh, whether you're a holy saint or a sinner, you'll be praised and blamed. Uh, it doesn't matter what happens. Uh, uh, people who are sinners are praised by other sinners. Yes. That's quite true. I've been in prison and the prisoners have come up to me and say, that guy, he was the number one thief in all of Perth. You know, he was a really good housebreaker. <laughs> they were praised. They were looked up to. <clears throat> uh, they were considered the best. Uh, and then they're blamed by others. If you're even the Buddha, was praised by some and blamed by some. We will be praised and we will be blamed. And so the ability to stay focused and centered, to have the equanimity of mind. But this quality of equanimity goes much deeper into the meditation <clears throat> become a spiritual quality of enlightenment. We have to have that equanimity towards when meditation is not going so well and when life is not going so well. That patience to wait for it to improve and change. Uh, to accept the ups and downs. Uh, life is not a flat path. Uh, it goes up and down. So to accept the rise uh, and the climb with the fall and the climb again and to know, ah, oh, this is just the way it is, it leads to a balance of mind. So these uh, uh, are the factors of enlightenment and I've just given an overview of what I want to say and what I was intending to say, but I've uh, explained the factors in more detail than I intended was to say, how do we balance these seven factors in our meditation? Uh, and the Buddha, in this discourse, he talked about, he gave the analogy of, if you're sitting meditation and the mind is dull, is slothful, the body is tired, and you're trying to watch an object like the breath, which is a very subtle object, which is a pacifying object of meditation, then you don't use certain factors of enlightenment and you should use others. So, for example, if you come to the meditation on a Friday night and you're sitting and you start to nod, then don't watch the breath. It doesn't matter what I say up here. If I give you a guided meditation and say watching the breath, it's not what you should be using at that time. You have to know your own mind. You have to know your own state. You have to know the condition here and now. Sometimes uh, giving a talk like this to a large audience, it's compared to, you know, uh, it's very hit and miss because we're all different. We're all at different stages, different levels, different temperaments, different qualities. And so you're generalizing most important thing is not what I say, it's what you know. Know yourself and adjust your meditation to how you're feeling, what's happening in your mind when you sit. So if you're feeling dull and sl sleepy, then you should not do uh, the forms of meditation which lead to tranquility and serenity because you become really serene. We've had people stretch out at the back there and snore and, uh, and I, I threatened to tell them that joke uh, which I'll just as a, uh, <clears throat> a, 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 a slip in, I'll tell it again for those who missed out just to wake you up if you are falling asleep at the back. 
um, is about the, the minister of religion who went, he died after teaching his religion for 45 years and went up to heaven. And as he got to the pearly gates, there was a rough-looking character in a leather jacket, long hair and tattoos all over him, leaning against the pearly gates, smoking cigarette. And, uh, and then St. Peter opened the pearly gates, uh, let them in, and they went over to the archangel and they were looking uh, through the book of good deeds. And the uh, archangel asked uh, the rough-looking fellow, um, you know, who are you? And he says, I'm a taxi driver. And the archangel looks and, he's, and he says, oh, very good, yes, you've done many good deeds. Yes, very good, very good, excellent. Uh, your palace is waiting for you over there. Here's your trumpeteers and here's your golden shroud. And he marches off and very happy. And so the minister is very uh, pleased. It's his turn to receive the good deeds of 45 years of teaching, uh, the good word. And so he marches up to the archangel and said, you know, I'm Reverend Smith and I've come to receive the good deeds of my work. And... Uh, Archangel looks through the book of good deeds. Hmm, not bad, not bad. And then he says, uh, there's your bungalow over there. Uh, there's your uh, one trumpet here and here's your brass shroud. And the, the minister says, but look, I've been teaching for 45 years. How come the cab driver uh, gets a huge palace and golden shroud and big ceremony and... Uh, they said, well, there's been changes up here. We're going by results now. And, uh, you know, it's called... Uh, uh, we're, we're changing the procedures. And what we've noticed is um, from the uh, results, every time you gave a sermon, people started falling asleep. And uh, <clears throat> everyone just dozed off. But every time someone got into that fellow's cab, they prayed to God. <laughs> and so I've been waiting for someone to fall asleep so I, uh, I can wake them up. So I, and so if you're feeling dull, what's a joke do? It brings up joy, doesn't it? There is a purpose behind telling that joke trying to weave in the purpose. The purpose is that when we when we joy, are joyous, what's that do? It stimulates us, it wakes us up, makes us effervescent. There's a sense of well-being, a sense of happiness. And that makes the mind bright and alert. Usually people who go to a comedian or a, uh, a comedy festival don't fall asleep in the background unless he's a really poor comedian. Because there's this laughter, there's this buoyancy, there's effervescence. Now obviously in Buddhism or in a spiritual path, you're not developing it to that degree of just kind of effervescent enthusiasm. You're developing it to the point of inner joy, this inner happiness, an inner delight in goodness. Uh, so it brings this delight up and that wakens up the mind. So if you're feeling dull and sleepy, then pick up a meditation object, say it be it on loving kindness or just on goodness and generosity. Think of all the good things you've done today. That's meditation. If you cultivate thoughts of thinking about the good deeds that you or other people have done, that it encourages, it cultivates the repetition of those good deeds because one delights in that. I think it's wonderful, it's marvellous that kindness and goodness is done in the world by either myself or others. It's just a kind act. It doesn't belong to anyone. It's kindness expressed. That's wonderful, that's marvellous. And that brings joy to the mind. And that wakes one, is up, wakes one up. The other quality, if you're feeling dull, is to arouse energy, uh, to you know, put, put more effort in the meditation, put more energy, sit up straighter, stand up, breathe in and out quickly. Uh, and that puts this energy in to the meditation. Uh, the other quality to develop if one is dull is to, if you still find you're falling asleep, then start contemplating. 
start to consider, start to think, but think in a skillful, wise way. Start to look at the qualities of, say, feeling in the body. Or start to even contemplate and think. If you're freely falling asleep, start to think about your own demise. Start to think about death. Ah, if this was my last breath, would I like to die at this point in time? If this was my last thought, would I be content to die with this thought? Or to breathe in very deeply. Ajahn Chah used to recommend this to us. If you're falling asleep, then breathe in very deeply and hold your breath. For a long time. And I reassure you that you wake up pretty quickly. It's actually a way of challenging the dullness. Wakes the mind up. And the other quality which you need to develop is awareness, mindfulness. What am I doing? What's going on? Am I focused? Do I know? Can I recall the present moment? What's happening? Because dullness is blocking out, isn't it? It's that not wanting to know. I couldn't care. I want to get rid of. I want to crash out, block out, annihilate. And, you know, all those terms that people use about going to bed, I'm going to crash out. Yes? You know, I don't want to know what's going on. I've had enough. I'll switch off. And so we're switching on. Uh, Turning on. Turning on the mind to brightness and awareness and clarity. So these are the qualities that one develops when the mind is dull. Now, when the mind is agitated, and excited, then one develops the other factors of enlightenment. If the mind is excited, then one does develop an object which is serene and tranquil. Uh, If you're excited and frustrated and agitated, don't do contemplation of death. It'll make you more agitated. Yes? Uh, It's not what you need. You need to maybe relax. Just let it be. Be at peace. You're okay. Develop a meditation which is kinder and gentler and softer. One which is serene and calming. One which stills the mind down. So if that endless running of thoughts and activities, it's okay, it's okay, let it go. Just let it run down and quieten down. Just like you're calming a disturbed and agitated child which is screaming. You don't shake the child or hit the child. You calm, stroke the child, rock the child, sing to the child. Be gentle and loving to that child. To calm the child down, to reassure it, to give it trust and confidence. Uh, And then the child generally, after a while, goes to sleep. So the mind, when it's agitated, develop prasadahi, tranquility. We develop equanimity. And if you're agitated about what went on at work today or what happened to you or what will happen to you, it's okay. Just let it be. Whatever will happen, will happen. Just be balanced and focused and let things arise and pass away. And one develops this one-pointedness of mind, the focus on stillness and peace and tranquility. And the thing again we need to always have is mindful awareness, to be circumspect, to be totally aware and conscious of what we're doing when we're doing it. And so when we develop these qualities, that will still the agitated mind. And the Buddha gave an analogy for this. He said, uh, if a person has a fire and they want that fire to rise up, uh, then they don't put wet grass on that fire, they don't put wet uh, timber on that fire, they don't put water on that fire because they want that fire to rise up. What they do is put uh, dry grass, dry timber, they blow on that fire so that fire will brighten up. So too, when the mind of a meditator is dull, You don't use an object 
which is based in tranquility, which is based in samadhi, which is based in equanimity, because that will make the mind even duller. You need to use an object which is based in uh, investigation of truth, energy and perseverance, and rapture. It's like a person who puts the dry timber, dry sticks on that fire. And the opposite is true. If the person has a fire and that fire is blazing away and it's in danger of getting out of control and burning down, starting a forest fire, burning down the house, then you don't put dry sticks and blow on it and put fuel on that fire because you want that fire to dampen down. So you put water on that fire to dampen that fire down. So too, a person, a meditator's mind, which is agitated, which is restless, which is frustrated, which is angry, which is negative. Now that person whose mind is wild and cannot be stilled, uh, that person, they don't develop energy at that time. They've got too much mental energy. They don't develop investigation and thinking at that time. Uh, They don't develop rapture because it will lead to this exuberance, excessive exuberance. What they need to develop is the calming, the serenity, uh, the tr- aspect of tranquility, uh, the aspect of, of uh, equanimity. You need to calm the mind down and, may, and then the aspect of concentration to make the mind both tranquil, concentrated and equanimous. That calms that fire the agitated mind. And so this is actually how a meditator learns to use the psychological factors that lead to awakening, that lead to liberation, as tools in their path, as tools in their, uh, their uh, toolbox of meditative skills or psychological skills. So when you meditate, just don't repeat the same subject over and over again regardless of how it works. Look at the results, what's happening here and now, and use the object, use the subject which is appropriate so that we can incline to awakening, we can incline to liberation, we can incline to freedom, we can incline to Nibbana. So, thank you.